Over the course of these last few weeks, we have been engaged together as a church family in journeying through kind of a mini-series focused upon the Bible. And over the last couple of weeks, we've spent some time digging into looking at the origins of the Bible, where did it come from, and its authority. How do we understand the role that it's meant to have in our lives as followers of Jesus? And so today we want to spend some time as we wrap up this series uh, asking the question of, of how do we understand the Bible and understand its, uh, its meaning for our lives today. And as I spent some time preparing for this message, I uh, was reflecting on my own journey with the Bible, which, which uh, I'm really blessed that that began early in life. And I brought a couple Bibles with me today. This is, in fact, uh, my first Bible, which was given to me as a gift by my small town home church, a First Baptist Church. And uh, this was given to me as a gift at the conclusion of grade one. And I'll never forget how, uh, as I peeled off the cellophane wrapping from this Bible, that I felt very grown up. And it felt like kind of a big deal that I held my own Bible in my hands. And I understood the significance that this was God's word to us. And I remember uh, feeling like this is something important. But I have to confess that uh, this Bible and I, we never really got along very well. And uh, uh, part of the reason for that is because you can't really see this very well, but it has extremely tiny print that's just wedged in there with small margins. And I remember as a small child just feeling kind of overwhelmed by the, uh, the imposing look of the page. And uh, you'd need a magnifying glass to read this thing comfortably, I think. And then it was in the King James. And so for me as a child of uh, seven, eight years old, uh, I just had a hard time connecting with uh, the language uh, from 450 years earlier. But still, I see some evidence in here that I tried. I see things that were highlighted and underlined and things of that sort. But when I think about the role of this particular Bible in my life, it, it, was just, it was a struggle to understand its meaning and its meaning for my life. Then I received my second Bible on the day that I was baptized, early in high school. My family and I had relocated to another city, and that day as I was baptized, I was gifted with this copy of the Student Bible. And I'll never not forget the uh, eagerness that I had when I peeled off the cellophane wrapper from this one, too, and cracked it open. And uh, my experience was vastly different. And part of it is that it, it's a really nicely laid out NIV Bible in modern language, but also I was at a place in my life where God's Holy Spirit was doing significant things in me. And there was a hunger and eagerness to read scripture that I hadn't experienced before. And there were times where I found it difficult to pull myself away from studying the scripture to just go and eat dinner with my family. And for the first time, it felt like the words were coming alive to me and jumping off the page. And uh, such a hunger to read the word, but also in a way that I'd never experienced before, I found my own life being read by the word as God's word spoke into the deep places of my own life and formed me as a follower of Jesus. So for me, the engaging with scripture has been a, a lifelong journey of trying to understand it and its meaning for my life. As we look at the ministry of Jesus, we can see that over and over again, he had these encounters where he was conversing with people and he would say things like, what have you read? How do you understand it? We see it, for example, illustrated in an exchange that he has with the, the teacher of the law in Luke 10, 26, where he simply asks, what is written in the law? How do you read it? I think this is an important question for us even today as well. This is God's word to us. It has important things to say to us. It is meant to transform us, to guide us in living in God's way and living for God's glory today. But how do we read it rightly? How do we read it responsibly? Like Paul expresses to Timothy in 2 Timothy, uh, he says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. So what does it mean for us today to correctly handle the word of truth? 
So in the brief time that we have together, I want to just offer a few practical pointers to aid us in in being those kinds of people who are handling God's word responsibly, rightly, in such a way that we can understand its true meaning for us today. But before I get to the, to, the, to the main stuff of that, I want to just offer three important things that I think we should bear in mind as we come to our own engagement with Scripture. And the first is that it's important for us to read it in context. Now, I don't know about you, but I know for many of us today, our tendency is to make a beeline straight to asking the question, what does this mean to me? And we're told that we are currently residents of this postmodern world where we're all encouraged to construct our own sense of meaning. And in that uh, environment, there have actually been developed these reader-oriented approaches to literature. So whether it be The Catcher in the Rye, The Scarlet Letter, or Shakespeare, our concern is not so much with the meaning that the text bears, but rather the meaning that is assigned to it by the reader. But as we look to Scripture, we can recognize that this is indeed, as we've explored over the last couple of weeks, God's word to us, that it has an intended meaning that we are invited to discover and to receive. Now, God's word to us, understandably uh, and unfortunately, has not been delivered by direct mail. In other words, it wasn't written in the assumptions of our time, but rather, uh, it, uh, to get to the meaning, we have to overcome some distance between our world today, the time and place in which we find ourselves, and the world of, uh, of, the, of the ancient times in which it was written, the time and place where it was first delivered. Now, fortunately, the Bible is not otherworldly. It's not something that is so complex and confusing that we need to quit our lives and go and sit on a mountaintop and devote our, our lives to studying it in order to try to crack the code of its meaning. So much of it in the translations that we have been gifted with today is readily accessible and very clear. But there are places where we need to be conscious of the cultural distance between the ancient world and our world today. Uh, One of the ways in which I've come to appreciate this in recent times is one of the things that's been going on in the the Seibel household during the COVID era as we've been trying to keep ourselves occupied. We have become obsessed with K-dramas, Korean dramas. They're really good. You should check them out. But I have these moments along the way where, despite the the translation on the captions that you see on the screen, something is expressed. And in the translation from Korean language to the English, I'm like, I think I missed something there. There's probably some vital information that would help me to understand what just happened, because I'm not getting that joke. And then there are things that you see these people doing in the context of their own culture that I'm like, huh. That's different. And as I've spent some time Googling to try to understand Korean culture, I've learned things like whenever you receive something from an elder, you always receive it with both hands. It's a fine detail that's something that's really important in their culture, but that you would miss it unless you really knew what was going on. So the same applies with the Bible. We can find ourselves at times reading something and saying, well, what does this mean? What's going on here? Take, for example, uh, what the Bible has to say about family. Now, the Bible has lots of really powerful things to say for families today. But we need to understand it in its original context before applying it to our family life today. Because uh, the way that family life was structured and experienced in ancient times is very different than how families are structured and go about life today. They simply did not live in an environment of mom and dad and their 2.5 kids. In fact, in, in much of the time when scripture was written, you'd have multi-generational families of up to four generations living together on the same property. And so if you receive God's word as an adult member of the Jewish community that says, honor your father and your mother, in that environment, it takes on different meaning than the world in which we find ourselves today. It has relevance for us, surely, 
but it's helpful for us to understand what was going on in the original context before we seek to move, it, move on and apply it to our own. So we need to consider that context first, and we'll return we'll to this in just a few moments. But secondly, I want to encourage you that it's important for us to read Scripture in community. Now, our culture is very focused, almost obsessed on the individual, and maybe we tend to think about Bible reading as a, a solitary experience, but it's really crucial for us to recognize that the Bible isn't just a me book. It is a we book. It's an us book. You've heard it expressed, surely, that uh, the, so many of the references to you in uh, the New Testament are better translated y'all, as they used to say in the South where we lived, or as they would say in the northern parts of the United States, uh, you guys, or as they said along the Mason-Dixon line, the, the boundary between the North and the South where my wife and I used to live, uh, all y'all guys. <laughs> it's important to recognize that for us as Christians that this is an all y'all guys book that we're meant to engage in together. And so as I experienced as a teenager, the Bible can be a powerful book, a transformational book for us when we read it personally. But we also bring to our engagement with Scripture our own perspective that is based upon where we came from and the experiences that have shaped us. And in some ways, that, that causes us to come with certain biases, certain lenses, certain blind spots that can impact how we engage with God's truth. And so it's helpful for us to have a community that we can bring our understanding to and can say, hey, listen, I've been reading the Bible this week and, and I'm processing this. Can, can you help me wrestle with this together? We heard an example of that read uh, before the message today as the Bereans, were told in Acts chapter 17, received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They're modeling for us as a community trying to discerningly grapple together with scripture and to understand its meaning for them. So I want to just leave you with that question today. Who are you digging into scripture with in community these days? And if that answer is no one, we'd love to assist you in getting you connected with a group where you can dig in and read it in community together. And then thirdly, it's important to read it with the cloud. Now, when you hear that word today, the cloud, what does it make you think of? Perhaps it makes you think of uh, this whole global web-based data storage network of servers that remind us that our lives today are linked into this, uh, this global information age where we have ready access to anything you could possibly want to get information about, this information superhighway where we can find answers to virtually any question in a flash. Now, the internet, if you desire to be a student of scripture, can actually be a wonderful resource. But for us, it can also be part of the problem. Because the truth of the matter is that it, the, if you just Google it, you will find something somewhere on the internet that will confirm even the most harebrained idea that you might have. Surely there is a blogger somewhere in the world who has written about it and who will confirm your suspicions even if it's not actually helping you move towards faithfulness to Scripture. That's not actually the cloud that I'm referring to today. I'm, I'm referring to another cloud, the one that Scripture speaks to in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, when it refers to this great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before us. Now, there's much that we today can learn from the great men and women of the faith down through the ages who have grappled with the scripture and they've devoted their lives to the study of God's word. And I occasionally hear people expressing, I don't care what men have had to say about the Bible. I only want to encounter God's word directly. And I will say to you today that I recognize and respect the earnestness and the sincerity that I hear in that. But if we pause for a moment and consider that, we can recognize that it's also maybe a bit naive. And it is also perhaps a tad prideful. Am I really superior 
to those who have gone before me, who have spent their whole lives studying scripture, do I really have nothing to gain or to be learned from those people? There's a term that's been de- de- described for this, uh, coined for this, called chronological chauvinism. And it's a term that's merely meant to capture this notion that those of us who are in the here and now are somehow superior or more sophisticated than those who have lived in the past. Where we're wired up with this notion that newer is better. But that's not necessarily always the case. And maybe uh, you are of the opinion that history is simply stuffy and irrelevant But I want to just encourage you today to consider that those who have gone before us, that great cloud of witnesses, people of faith down through the ages, these were real people who were really engaged in the struggle in their own time with real hearts and and real minds, just like you and me in the here and now. Now, mind you, they, they read scripture within their own culture just as we do, so sometimes They didn't get it right because they had their own biases and blind spots. And Bible scholarship has advanced. We've made some significant archaeological discoveries digging around in the sand in the Middle East that helped us understand some things better that people in in the past haven't known. But the chances that you and I today are going to come up with something that truly novel, something truly wholly new that Christians down through the ages, it's never occurred to them. It seems a a tad unlikely. So it's helpful that we pause to check and say, if my understanding of what God is saying here in Scripture can't be substantiated or supported by that great cloud of witnesses, I should pause to, to exercise some care. Now, the Internet can actually be a really great tool for us in this regard, Because you'll discover if you go poking around that the full text of most uh, anything that's in the public domain, things that are from before the time of of copyright, are are available in full text form online, where you can find out directly what great men and women of the faith down through the ages have had to say about things. So I encourage you to uh, consider the cloud. You might want to at times come to your community and say, do you think that this is consistent with how Christians historically have understood these things? And maybe even if you find yourself grappling with those questions, you might come to one of us as leaders within uh, the faith community. We'd be pleased to chat with you about that question, about how have Christians down through the ages wrestled with the question that you find yourself asking. But it's important that we recognize that we stand within an interpretive community that reaches across generations and that spans ages. So I encourage you today, let's be reading in context and reading in community and reading in the cloud. But before uh, I conclude today's message, I want to take just a few moments and invite you to explore together with me a simple framework for how we can dig into Scripture in a way that goes after uh, understanding its intended meaning for us. Now, this is going to be a quick flyover, a brief summary. And for those of you who perhaps have been through YWAM or were part of an inner varsity Christian fellowship group on campus or have been part of a precept ministry Bible study fellowship group, some of what I'll share today uh, might be a refresher, review for you, but it's helpful for us as a whole community together to consider what it looks like for us to be people who are seeking to rightly, responsibly handle God's word. And as I ponder that, I recognize that uh, sometimes in my own life, I find myself on a hurry to get to somewhere, and um, I'm driving across town, and I drive through the A&W drive-through, and as I'm driving uh, 60 kilometers per hour down 75th Street, I'm stuffing food into my mouth. And there are times even at home at at the dinner time when uh, my mind is, is reeling because of things I've got going on or I, I'm wrestling with anxiety, I'm feeling hurried, where my wife has prepared a beautiful meal and she puts it down, and because of what's going on inside of me, I just stuff it in. 
And then I get to the end and I think, oh man, that looked like really good food. I probably should have savored that. I barely even pay attention to its taste. And so I've had to learn at times to slow down and even to be intentional about cutting things into small pieces so that I can force myself with the discipline of simply taking the food and taking time to enjoy it and not miss out on it. And this framework that I want to spend a few moments together with you today uh, invites us to approach Scripture in that same way. Less in a stuffing it in as we drive 60 kilometers an hour down 75th Street mode, but more of a let's pause to savor it and to appreciate its flavor for our lives. So less the fast food version, but a version that invites us to slow down and to take it in. So this approach has four simple movements. First, we begin with prayer, where we ask the question of, what's going on in my heart? And we move on to observe. What does the text say? And after we've spent some time engaged in that, we, we interpret what does the text mean? And then the end game of it all is to apply. How should this impact my life? So I want to just briefly take each one of these in turn and to consider how we can walk through a process like this. First of all, we begin with prayer. As we approach a time to, to engage with God's word, it's good for us to stop. And the great theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer encouraged people to become silent before the word, to stop, to pause, and to check our own hearts and to say, what's going on in me today? What level of readiness do I possess to hear, to receive, and to obey God's word. And it's an opportunity for us to pray for God to give us receptive hearts and for the Holy Spirit to lead us into the truth that God has for us. So it's important to begin there. But then to move on into a, a, a process of observation where we ask, what does the text say? And here we take time to make these observations uh, uh, where we can pay attention to the, the five W's and the one H. The who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how. And asking those kinds of questions of the text invites us to get in there a little bit more deeply and to pay attention to the nitty-gritty of what's happening. And we may want to pay attention even to the mood and the tone of the text. And what, is, what hints is that giving us of what's going on here and the meaning that this passage is meant to convey to us. And it's important for us as well to pay attention to key words that seem to be popping up in the text. For example, if you go to 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, you'll see the word suffering pop up three times in that passage. Well, that gives you an important hint about what uh, Peter is seeking to get at in this passage and helps us to pay attention and then even to pay attention to where we see comparisons and contrasts. And we see lots of these in Scripture between good and, and wicked, between proud and humble. And these help us to get some hints of the life that God truly intends for us as his people over against the patterns of this world. And we can pause to make lists, what lists of things that we see, key points that we're encountering in Scripture. We can read through the book of Colossians, for example, and make a list of what are all the things that this book seems to be saying about our relationships with one another as people of faith. And pay attention to terms of transition and terms of conclusion. Terms of transition are words like therefore. As one of my Bible teachers always said, that whenever you see therefore, you should ask what it's there for. It's telling us something about movement and the logical development of the passage. And, and a word like Paul uses many times where he says, finally, which is a hint to us. It's like a movie that's reaching its, its climax, that he's coming to his point and he's wanting us to really pay attention to what he's saying here as he's wrapping things up. So these are ways that we can observe closely what's happening in the text. But then we move on to interpretation where we're asking, what does the text mean? And here we might pay attention to the questions that the text raises for us. 
And it's always important to, to read in context, to pay attention to what comes before and after, rather than just parachuting one isolated verse out of its context. I remember when I first began studying the Bible in college that one of my professors gave us a sheet that had an entire baseball game narrated that was made from uh, scripture, uh, scripture verses that were taken out of context. Like, so-and-so hit, and then so-and-so ran home. <laughs> and you can make scripture and twist it to mean almost anything if you take things out of context. So it's important that we pay attention to uh, verses in context. And to consider cross-references Reading scripture in light of scripture. So what does the Bible elsewhere have to say about this point that I find myself grappling with here? And it's helpful for us to pull back and try to pay attention to the big picture and, and think about the harmony of scripture and how the pieces fit together so that we don't get hung up on an obscure verse somewhere along the way. We can look for the overarching meaning of it all. One of the Bibles that I didn't bring with me today is a Bible that I got in my 20s that had big margins, margins in it that will, it encouraged you to write little notes, but also one of its features that I found particularly challenging, whereas if you look at most Bibles today, they have headings for each section. This Bible, in the place where you'll find headings in your Bible, had blanks which uh, presented you with the challenge when you've read a passage to sit with it long enough to try to be able to summarize in one phrase the core idea of that passage. It was a good discipline, but one that I found really challenging at times to be able to spend enough time digesting the meaning of this section of Scripture that I could summarize in one phrase what I think God is saying to us here. Some resources that could be really helpful to you in that. Uh, a good study Bible often has notes that can aid us in, in uh, grappling with some of the questions that we find ourselves asking of the text. And as you go online, there's some really valuable resources that we can find there as well, coming from faithful sources. And one thing that I'll commend to you today is BibleGateway.com, which uh, the free version gives you access to lots of really amazing goods, Bible dictionaries, and, and uh, ability to look up scripture passages and to find every passage in the entire Bible where the word family appears. But for the low, low price of only $39.99 a year American, you can uh, open access to a whole bunch of other really amazing features. And, and what is that? That's just like three months of Netflix subscription or something like that? The access to that kind of wealth of resources to help us become more diligent students of Scripture, it's an amazing deal. So I'd encourage you to consider checking that out if you'd like to access some resources that would be helpful to you in interpreting. But finally, we come to our end game as followers of, of Jesus, which is to apply and to ask the question of how should this passage of Scripture impact my life? James speaks to this in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, where he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So James offers us an important reminder here that it, it's really not the point to read scripture and then to walk away and to forget it, but rather to let it sink deep into our lives in such a way that by God's grace and the empowerment that his spirit provides that we would, that we would walk in it, that we would live it. And so as we think about how we apply scripture and that question of how does it impact my life, it should be anchored in the text's meaning as we've come to understand it, where we ask questions like, what is God's instruction to me today, this week? And this will vary from time to time, from person to person. As I look back through my uh, student Bible from many years ago and look at some of the verses that I highlighted at that time, I can recognize that the application significance of some of those verses in my life is very different now as a 40-something dad 
with a teenage daughter who's the same age that I was when I got this Bible. And that will be true in every one of our lives as well. But it's about accepting God's truth and living in it. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So God desires for us to experience this in our lives, the living impact of Scripture in the deep places of our lives. And some who have have written about this and taught about this say that it's helpful for us then to develop applications that are sharp, which is an acrostic that stands for specific. How can I uh, recognize the significance of this passage of Scripture in a way that's specific enough that I can truly live into it and I can know whether I'm doing it or not in my present circumstances. And one that honors the the text, that's faithful to the text. One that invites accountability where I say to, to God and I say to myself and when necessary, I say it to others. Listen, I want to be held accountable to how I've come to understand the significance of this passage of Scripture for my life today. And an application that's risky, recognizing that when God calls us to step out as people of the kingdom and to break from the patterns of this world, there's always risk in that, to live differently than how the world would encourage us to, to live differently than how the old quarry would live, but to live in the new way. But God desires for us to live into the risk of that. And then to consider applying prayerfully. So let's look to apply scripture in a way that's sharp, that's specific, that honors the text, that invites accountability, that's risky, and that's prayerful. So we've kind of journeyed through these quickly, but just to recap, one framework that we can use in coming to understand scripture and to handle it rightly and responsibly is this process that moves from prayer, what's going on in my heart, to observation, what does the text say? To interpretation, what does the text mean? And application, how should this impact my life? As we draw this message to a close, and we're going to transition to communion in just a few moments, I do want to leave you with a few on-ramps, some things that we can take with ourselves today as we consider the significance of the things we've been chatting about here for our own lives. First of all, if time is a a factor that's limiting your engagement with Scripture. If your engagement with Scripture has been predominantly microwave fashion or as though you you were careening down 75th Street, stuffing it down your mouth, what steps might you need to take to carve out a little bit more time to dig into Scripture more deeply? And secondly, are you actively studying Scripture together with others? If not, what's hindering you from doing so? And what might you do to overcome those barriers? And how might the simple inductive Bible study process that we've looked at here briefly today enrich your engagement with Scripture? Let's just pause to pray. Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As the psalmist reminded us in the reading earlier today, uh, it is more precious than silver, more costly than gold. We thank you, Lord, that you have shined your light into the darkness of our reality. You have given us your word of truth. We pray, Lord, that today and the days ahead, that you would do a renewing work in our lives, that you would give us a hunger and a determination to listen to your counsel, to receive uh, what you would teach us about your will, your way, our lives your desire for this world. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray. Lead us into your truth. And above all else, Lord, we pray that you would continue to lead us to Jesus and how we see him at the the heart of what scripture reveals to us. May you receive honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.